All right, you guys can turn, if you want to, to 2 Samuel 23. That'll be our passage for this morning. Um, uh, some of you might remember that Scott was due to speak this morning um, and to kick off a new series. And as the old saying goes, if there's one thing better than Scott speaking, it's Scott launching a new series. So uh, I'm going to be speaking about dealing with disappointment this morning, just to <laughs> get us all through the moment. But <laughs> uh, no, but in, in all seriousness, you know, Scott couldn't be here this morning. Uh, so, and when he reached out to me um, to, to ask me about speaking, actually that, that day, I felt like God had put this passage on my heart and I feel like it's a... Uh, it's a word for the church. It's a now word. Uh, and so I am excited to bring it. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. So let's read 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. This is kind of in a section where um, the, the author is just listing some of David's mighty men and some of the accomplishments that they achieved. And it says this, uh, Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi the Hararite, when the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. What a cool little story, huh? Uh, so the name of my message this morning is, It is Time to Take a Stand. Uh, and what we're going to talk about this morning is the fact that we are called uh, to warfare. Uh, we're called not to shrink back from the, uh, the battles that, that are in our lives and that are raging in this earth, but we're called to take our stand and to be involved in the fight. Uh, and as God started to speak this to me, I, I couldn't help but be aware of how much has come to us as a church on the message uh, of warfare. Uh, you know, we had a whole long series on that, didn't we? And then Scott recently taught about the fight for uh, power and the fight for truth. Uh, and, and even beyond those things, we've had three or four other teachings that have come up uh, as a kind of one-off thing that, that are on this topic of warfare. Uh, and so for myself, kind of in my, in my uh, natural self, I was thinking, this kind of feels awkward <laughs> to bring another, another uh, message of, uh, kind of about this topic. Um, but as I asked God about it, I felt that he was completely fine with it. I felt like, uh, you know, what is on your heart, God? And it was People need to know that we're in, a, we're in warfare, okay, that there's a fight going on. And so uh, I am uh, going to talk about that this morning. And, and you know, it's interesting um, for myself and with my, with my family, we've been reading through the Psalms. Uh, we take a Psalm uh, every, every night before we eat dinner and we'll read it through. And, um, and it's, been, it's been a great practice. It's been something that we've really loved doing. But, but as I've gone through the Psalms in that way, something that surprised me, kind of going one after another, is just how much enemy talk there is in the Psalms. It was kind of surprising to me. I thought there would be more about um, kind of descriptions of the greatness of God and uh, talk about our devotion to him. And of course, those things are in there too. Um, but probably because they're the ones that I naturally go to, I was kind of surprised by how relatively little uh, there is of that compared to enemy talk. Uh, and that you read the Psalms and it feels like almost every one um, is either about the enemies of God or comes to a conclusion uh, talking about the enemies of God, talking about the fact that there are enemies in David's or the psalmist's desire uh, to see the enemies of God defeated and to see God victorious and to see it outworked in their day. Um, and, and again, like I said, it kind of surprised me. And after a while, it started to almost frustrate me. Um, I felt like I don't, I don't want to read about enemies every night. I want to read more about uh, my love and devotion to God and these kinds of things. Uh, why is there so much enemy talk in the Bible, in the Psalms? And uh, it was actually only relatively recently that suddenly dawned on me that if, if I felt like the kind of relative weight of these topics in the Psalms was, was kind of wrong or kind of out of balance, that it probably wasn't God who was wrong. It was probably me. It was probably something in my mindset, my understanding that needed to be adjusted rather than me going to God and saying, hey, did you think about, you know, how this? So anyway, just had a, a nice kind of gentle rebuke there from God. But the fact of the matter is when you read through the Psalms every day, it, it, it literally is, you guys, almost every day, it's a reminder, there are enemies of God. There are enemies of the people of God. We are right in the middle of warfare and we need to hear it every day. Uh, and so for this morning, we're going to talk about uh, some of those elements and, and we're going to uh, look at what God has to say uh, through this story about that. 
Um, but but w- one more thing before we get going, you know, when we talk about um, the enemies of God are fighting battles, you know, there's lots of things um, that, that we could say, but it's important to know who those enemies are. Who are we actually fighting? And, um, a- and again, you know, we've had enough teaching on this that you probably know for yourself. As soon as we talk about the topic of warfare, you're thinking, yep, yeah, it's the fight of faith for me. I need to uh, fight to be in faith or I need to persevere in prayer. You might know what it is for you, but... Um, but listen, um, one thing that I want to bring up this morning is the issue of sin. Uh, and we need to wage war against sin in our own lives and in the church. Uh, you know, when the Bible talks about sin, uh, a lot of times it's talking about uh, sins that we do, things that we do. Uh, but sometimes uh, when it talks about sin, the, the context, it seems more like, um, it feels like uh, Satan or the enemy would fit better in the sentence. It almost seems to talk about sin as like a force that's out there uh, in the world. Uh, And that's because the enemy uh, works through sin, right? His basic strategy is, I want people to sin, uh, and that's gonna sow corruption and death into the world. That's what he did in Genesis 3, and he's just kept doing that ever since. Uh, And so what we need to know is that there's a a fight on our hands, uh, and it's whatever else it looks like, it looks very personal for us, is that we cannot accept sin in our own lives. We need to fight against it. We need to be engaged in that fight. So as we talk this morning about these dynamics uh, of fighting, again, feel free to apply these things to your own situation, but just have that in your mind too, is that we're all, uh, we're, we're all in this wrestle. Um, we're all in this fight um, to see God glorified in our lives, in our bodies, and for sin not to, to have its way in us. Does that make sense? Excellent. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's read the story one more time because it's short and it's so good. And then we'll get into, uh, into our points here. Uh, so it said, Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. Okay, so our first point here is just simply that Shammah took his stand. Okay, and we want to take our stand. Um, Shammah just found himself in this field of lentils. Lentils are like a kind of bean, if anyone doesn't know. Uh, And then they're like the least tasty bean as well. So um, I've been married for just about 10 years, and there's only one meal that my wife has made that I uh, really didn't enjoy. And it was like this lentil stew, and it just didn't taste very good. Um, but, she, but she tripled it so that we'd have leftovers. And so it's just, it's still etched into my memory is this, uh, you know, what's, what's for dinner tonight? Or what can I take? At the time I was studying at Carthage, and what can I take for, for lunch? And I said, well, we've got, you know, uh, lots of these lentils left. And uh, oh, thanks, honey. That's, that's great. We, th- that was in our first year of marriage, and I was too um, <laughs> polite at the time to <laughs> tell her my feelings about the, the lentils. So. Um, uh, yeah, a year later, after we'd worked through some stuff, we're feeling a little more comfortable. I, I eventually brought it up. You know, hey, the, you know that one um, like lentil stew that you made? And she's like, yeah, that was really good, wasn't it? And I was like, no. <laughs> please, if you love me, <laughs> please never make it again. Um, okay, but here he is. He just finds himself in this field of beans. Uh, when I was working on my message, my, my working title before I came up with It's Time to Take Our Stand was Protect Your Beans. <laughs> and I tested it on someone. They said, yeah, you can't, no, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> but that's it. He's just in this field of beans. Like, what, what does it matter in the, in the big picture of everything that's going on uh, in the nation? You know, this story, even though it's written at the end of David's life, uh, it's actually a, a memory back to uh, early in his life. It's actually before he became king. Uh, and we know that because the location is uh, this place called Lehi, which is uh, deep into the interior of, of the country. And so the Philistines were kind of carrying out this border raid. Uh, and they, they were really far in, at a place that they just wouldn't have been in during the reign of David uh, because he was uh, just much better at fighting the Philistines. His borders were much more secure. Uh, so this was during the reign of Saul when they were, just, they were coming in and uh, taking beans wherever they wanted to go. Uh, but our point is that there were big problems in the nation of Israel at that time. And Shammah could have thought, uh, you know, what's the, what's the point in me taking this stand? You know, the problems going on here are so much 
bigger than me. What we need is, you know, a change of leadership. We need David to be king. Uh, and that's just totally outside of my control. So, so why would I bother? Why would I not just flee uh, with everyone else? But, but what he thought is, no, I'm here in a field of beans. Uh, I'm going to take my stand right here. There's things outside of my control that I can't do something about. Uh, but, but here I am in this field, and I'm just not going to let the Philistines have my beans, okay? And so, uh, and that's, that's good, and that's a message for us because uh, we live in a world where, uh, you know, there's so much going on, isn't there? We can read uh, the news or watch the news and just be aware of um, just big things going on, and, and we can tend to think, well, what, what kind of an impact can I have on that? Or even on a church level, uh, you know, we can know of different problems, different people who are struggling, uh, these kinds of things. And we can think, what difference does it really make if I take my stand? What, what, what is that actually going to achieve? Uh, and that's a temptation to uh, just what I'm going to call fatalism. Yeah, it's this kind of what's the point? Uh, what difference does my, does my life make? Uh, it's that kind of drop in the bucket idea. Like even if I fight, uh, how is that going to affect the, the big picture of, of anything really? Uh, and we can, we can kind of have that mindset. We can feel that way. Uh, you know, I was just thinking um, that as a, as a school, on the School of Worship, we, uh, we actually go into Ebsola School every week. Uh, we go there and uh, each student has a, a classroom and they go in and just work with the teacher and uh, just try and love the kids and, and bless them and these kinds of things. And, um, and it's really great. You know, I mean, this total side point for a second, but, uh, you know, because we don't meet at Ebsola anymore, um, just to say, we have a massive open door at Epsola, Um and we, we're still in there. We're still having an impact in that school. Uh, so just want you guys to know that um, and be encouraged by it. And also just to say that um, you, we do have an open door. Uh, and so th this is way off of my point, but, um, but if you want to, if you still have a heart for Epsola School, um, there are ways to get involved. Uh, and Living Light has a, you know, we still have a lot of favor there. We still have uh, an open door there. You know, I was shocked that we could go in this year with just all of the COVID dynamics that were still current and still, you know, very much in the KUSD system in general. Uh, but the headmaster there essentially said, I am going to do whatever I can do uh, in order to have Living Light people in my school. Uh, so that's the kind of relationship that we have right now. So just to plan that thought, if you want to get involved, there are ways to do it. Uh, but anyway, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because Epsola School uh, is a school that has so much uh, kind of need. Um, and so sometimes when we go, it can feel like a drop in the bucket. Like, what difference is this actually going to make? There's so many kids. There's so much need. Um, and so we just pray every time before we go and we say, God, we're reminding ourselves that uh, we are bringing the kingdom of God into that place. And we just ask him to let our actions, uh, let our presence have impact there. Uh, and so what I'm saying here is just don't let the enemy trick you into thinking that it doesn't matter what you do. Um, don't feel like Shammah in that field. Does it matter if I keep the field? Does it matter if I give it up? It actually matters that we take our stand wherever we find ourselves. Like you have a place in time. You have a, a place in, you, you occupy a place in, in space. And God's put you there. So you have a field. And the instruction of God to you is take your stand. Okay, worry about your field and make sure that you're fighting and defending it. Um, you know, the Bible kind of over against this idea of, of fatalism or, or what does it matter. The Bible speaks an absolutely radical message that our lives matter immensely, that it really, really matters what we do. Uh, and so I was thinking about Abraham. I was thinking about uh, the call of Abraham in Genesis 12 uh, and the fact that uh, what has happened up until this point in the Bible is that the whole world has gone wrong. Like we had the fall of man and then the next seven, eight chapters are just this kind of spiral of, of, of humanity down into sin and depravity and, and all of these kind of things. And you get to the end of Genesis 11, you think, wow, the whole world is just so hopeless. Uh, and right at that moment, uh, God brings his answer into the situation. And it's such a shocking answer that sometimes we don't even realize that it is God's answer. But what he says is, Abraham, I'm calling you. I want you to go. Uh, basically, I want you to go and obey me. I want you to live for me. Uh, and if you do, I'll bless you. And the whole earth will be blessed through you. You know, and you just, yeah, here it is. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, 
and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so it's like the whole world is going wrong and it's not like God says, okay, well, I'll give up on the world. I'll just kind of take Abraham and bless him instead. No, God's like, my eyes are on the whole world. I want to do something about everything that's going on. So I'm gonna choose this one guy and if he'll actually live for me, if he'll actually obey me, I can change the world. I can, like, that's what the Bible says. Is if we will obey him, if we'll live for him, our lives have impact, that they matter, that it changes things, okay? Uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, very famous verse. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So again, notice what it says. If people actually live for me, if they pray, if they start to follow me, it's going to do something. The land is going to get healed. Impact is going to happen. What we're saying is your life matters. And not in a kind of special snowflake way, like, yeah, everyone's special to God. Uh, although that's true. But now, I mean, your actual life matters. It matters what you do. It matters that you say no to sin and live for God. It matters that you fight those secret battles that no one will see. Like they matter too. Our lives have impact. I feel more convinced of this than ever. I think that we'll get to the end of our lives. And, um, you know, if we're allowed to see from God's perspective uh, the impact of our lives, I just think it'll be so much greater uh, than we ever imagined. Um, both in a like encouraging way and sobering way. You know, I think there's things that we do and we just think, I don't know if that had any impact and we'll see. And no, it did. People, people were changed. You know, th this did something. Uh, but the other side too, maybe again, there's some kind of sin issue and you think, well, what's the big deal? Well, what does this really affect? Well, basically what you're doing is partnering with the enemy in his plan to, uh, to again, sow corruption into the earth. So yeah, it definitely matters. And again, God's grace uh, it is there and his forgiveness. Our sins are erased. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, but we're just saying that it matters. What we do matters and we need to recognize it and be a, awake to that. You know, I was just thinking about um, when I came to do the school of worship uh, and at that time uh, in my church back home in England, there have been a lot of families who I had uh, looked up to and, and the, um, the couple had ended up getting a divorce um, and these different things. And, and so at that point in my life, I'd become quite cynical towards uh, marriage in general and, and really just kind of Christians that I looked up to. I was, in my own kind of uh, quiet way, I was quite cynical. Uh, and I came here to um, Living Light Church. And one of the things that happened was I just saw healthy marriages. Uh, I lived with Jim and Nikki Buss, who some of you would know, um, who are just a wonderful couple. And I just got to see them kind of outwork their marriage and, and love each other. And, um, and I saw couples like, you know, Joel and Danielle Davis, uh, Ben and Heather Dahl Dahlstrom, just th these people. And, and I was so impacted by just seeing the health of their marriage. And they would, they would have no idea. You know, they're just, they're just doing what they're doing. Uh, but for me, it was kind of, in its own way, it was changing my life. Uh, and, so, and so what I'm saying here is we just never uh, know really the impact of our lives, but it matters. It matters that we take a stand. It matters that we say, okay, I am here in this field. I will fight. I will fight. I will live for God where I am. Uh, again, you know, uh, thinking about the Great Commission uh, in Matthew 28, where Jesus brings 12 disciples together and basically says, go obey what I'm going to tell you to do uh, and uh, let's change the whole world. You know, and you think, wouldn't you like a bigger group? Um, but I think Jesus is like, no, no, if these 12 people actually do it, if they do it, we can change the world. Uh, yeah, I was thinking too about Paul going to, yeah, how, how uh, much he wanted to visit Spain, it says in one of the letters. And why was he so keen to get to Spain? And I think it's just because he thought, I'm going to preach the gospel and some people are going to get born again. And if they genuinely do and, and they live for me, we can take Spain. We can take a whole country. Like Paul had just this idea that um, God has given us power uh, and we can fight and we can know great victories. And I just think we need to hear that and be refreshed in that and be refreshed in that in the circumstances that we're in. Like it is worth taking that fight. Just even thinking about John's prophetic word this morning and that, you know, that kid just kind of flailing around. Like if that's all you've got, then do it, flail, you know? That's better than just, well, I may as well sink and drown. Like, no, let's, let's do what we can do and know that again, 
it's going to work because we've got a God who's massively strong and powerful and will help us in that. So, you know, uh, yeah, let's fight and let's believe that it matters. Uh, you know, again, left to my own devices, I would just tend to take this uh, kind of fatalistic viewpoint. I don't know if it's just the way that I'm wired or, um, you know, you know the just influence from the culture around or what it is, but the Bible just doesn't allow me to take that viewpoint. Again, when I read the Bible, I'm like, no, th th this, is, this is wrong. My, my life is actually meant to have an impact, and it's important that I live it. It's important that I fight. Uh, so what we're saying here is you, you have a field. Where, wherever it is, you have a field, uh, and take your stand right there. Um, be encouraged uh, to fight the fight. Fight the fight of faith and know that it matters. Okay, uh, my second point here is that uh, we are to persevere. So in this fight that we find ourselves in, uh, we must persevere. And this story is so inspiring because that's what Shama does. Uh, you know, it says that everyone else ran away. Uh, and it doesn't say why. Uh, maybe w they were scared or maybe they were discouraged, just like we've been talking about. Maybe they just finally felt like, what's the point? Why don't we just run and hide instead? But Shama said, no, no matter how bad things get, uh, I'm, I'm just going to stay in the fight. I'm going to keep going. Uh, and the thing about the Philistines is that they, they kept coming. Uh, the, this fight with the Philistines had been going on actually for generations. Uh, and then there were lots of setbacks. Uh, and this, this point is a particularly low point uh, in the story. In fact, let's just read uh, a passage from around this time in uh, 1 Samuel 13. Uh, so this is just kind of a description of what things looked like at this point in their fight with the Philistines. And it said, uh, there were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them uh, for fear that they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to the Philistines uh, to a blacksmith. So that's a bad situation, right? Um, and you kind of think, Saul, what are you doing? Like, why don't you train up some? But yeah, okay. Uh, the charges were as follows. A quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening one plowshare or pick. An eighth of an ounce for sharpening an axe or making the point of an ox goad. So the point there is no one could afford to uh, maintain weapons and keep them sharp. So on the day of battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear except for Saul uh, and Jonathan. This was a dark hour for the people, right? Um, and, and again, in that exact context... Um, Shammah just said, you know what? I am going to keep fighting. I'm going to persevere. And if we're, uh, you know, if, we, if we're willing to be in this fight, uh, we do need to know this. We need to know that there's going to be times that really require uh, perseverance. Again, um, you know, just to take the example of our fight against sin, there are some times where we, uh, where we fight, where we say, no, I'm going to partner with God. I'm going to live uh, righteously. And, uh, and there's sometimes where temptation just, just comes or you find yourself falling into the same things, uh, even though you're trying to fight. And there can be this, this uh, question of, uh, what am I doing wrong? What am I missing? Uh, and sometimes the truth is we're not doing anything wrong. You just need to keep doing the stuff you're doing, right? We just need to persevere. We need to keep going. We need to not get weary, uh, not get discouraged by a setback, but say, no, no, no matter what happens, I will stay in this fight. Uh, I want to show you a little clip from a movie. It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, it's called Darkest Hour. Uh, it's about Winston Churchill and World War II. And just to give you a little bit of context here, um, uh, so the movie is set right at the beginning of Churchill's uh, prime ministership in England. Uh, and he's become prime minister in unusual circumstances uh, because um, Germany is getting more and more powerful. And, uh, and basically everyone agrees we need a change of leadership right now. Uh, we need, and Churchill's the man to, to lead the country at this point. But it's a very dark hour because uh, basically the whole of Europe is falling to Nazi Germany. Uh, and then for, for Churchill, uh, because of his, uh, uh, the, the previous leader, he's just finding England completely unready uh, for the fight. Okay, so it's a, it's a very bleak situation. And what's more, uh, now people on his own side in his own cabinet are actually trying to... Uh, uh, trip him up in his words and tell, and tell him, you know, you need to give up now. Um, you need to make peace with Hitler. That's the only option that makes any sense at this point. Uh, so it's not even like he has um, kind of friends around him in this fight. He's just completely alone. Uh, and so in that context, uh, 
this scene happens. When I chose my war cabinet, I took great care to surround myself with old rivals. I may have overdone it. <laughs> Why can't Halifax? The approach you propose is it's, it's, it's not only, it's futile. But it involves us in a deadly danger. The deadly danger here is this romantic fantasy of fighting to the end. What is the end, if not the destruction of all things? There's nothing heroic in going down fighting if it can be avoided. Nothing even remotely patriotic in death or glory if the odds are firmly on the former. Nothing inglorious in trying to shorten a war that we are clearly losing. Losing! Europe is still... Europe is lost. And before our forces are wiped out completely, now is the time to negotiate in order to obtain the best conditions possible. Hitler will not insist on outrageous terms. He will know his own weaknesses. He will be reasonable. When will the lesson be learned? When will the lesson be learned? How many more dictators must be uh, wooed? Appeased, good God, given him mixed privileges, before we learn. You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. Prime Minister. I can stop right there, right? It's so good. You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. And, and this is the thing. Any time that we compromise... Uh, with the enemy, anytime we say, I'm just going to take the easier route, it's always the wrong decision. No matter how hard things get, no matter how long you've been fighting for, the message of the Bible is keep fighting, keep in the fight. We have God on our side. He will win the victory in the end. The only question is, can you stay in it long enough? Can you persevere? And then you get to partner with that great victory. It's so... That is a fantastic movie, you guys. Just, you know, uh, go, go and watch it. <laughs> it's really good. It's called Darkest Hour. Again, this is the reason Shammah was included in the record. It's because he stayed in the fight when everyone else gave up. He just said, I'm not going to give up. You know, Ephesians 6, 13 uh, it's this passage about the armor of God. Uh, but before it gets into the armor that we're to put on, it says, therefore, uh, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Or another uh, translation says, after you've done everything, keep standing. And that's the idea here is however long the battle's going on, uh, no matter what comes our way, uh, our attitude is, I will keep standing. I will stay in this fight no matter what. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Again, this is the message of the Bible is you are on the winning side. Your life does have impact. God is going to win a great victory. You just need to not give up. Stay in it. Stay in it. Stay in it with your kids. You know, if they're just making bad decision after bad decision, just think, I am staying here. I'm standing uh, in this relationship, in this fight. I'm going to continue uh, to parent them to the best of my ability. Stay in that fight with sin. Don't get to the point where you think it, it would just be easier to learn to live with this. No, keep fighting. Stay in uh, home group. Stay in home group leadership. You know, sometimes as home group leaders, we think, is, uh, is my home group really having any impact? Does it matter? Uh, and the truth is, yes, it matters. And it matters that you keep leading. It matters that you stay in it. it it's significant. Okay, it's so significant. Uh, and so whatever aspect of our life it is, whatever we're saying, we're just saying we're not going to give up. We will uh, keep fighting. This is just baked into the cake of our Christian lives. You know, going back to to Abraham, God gave him this promise that he was going to change the world and it was going to happen through, uh, through him uh, having kids and having a family. And, and decades later, he still hadn't had a son. Decades later. And you just think, man, how, how, 
how much perseverance did he need to say, I'm, I'm going to keep living for God. I'm going to keep going for it, you know. Uh, and you think about the, um, you know, the taunt of the enemy that could have been in his life at that point. You know, you just, what, what voices was he hearing in his head? You know, like, uh, yeah, this, this God seems super faithful, Abraham. Yeah, <laughs> he really seems like he's able to fulfill his promises to you, you know. And, and just year after year after year, he had to say, I don't have all the answers, I don't know, but I know that I'm not going to stop living for God. I know that God told me to go and live for him. I'm going to keep on at it. I'm going to keep persevering no matter what. And, and we're so glad that he did, right? Because in the end, he got the promise, and in the end, uh, the world was changed. Uh, you know, for, um, for Kim and I and our home group, um, the, the start of 2022 has been actually quite discouraging. We've had different things that we've been praying for and asking God for um, that, that have not happened. You know, we've, we've heard this message of reach to God for power, reach for miracles. So we said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to ask God to see these miracles. Um, and, and in certain situations, we didn't see them. Um, and so, but for us, we just, okay, we don't know why those things didn't happen. We don't know why we're not seeing the things yet that we're praying for. But we've only got one option. We just have to keep praying for the miracles, right? We have to keep reaching to God. We've got to persevere. Uh, I just don't want to be a person who says, yeah, things got a bit discouraging and I kind of gave up. I, I settled back into uh, where I was already at. You know, I want to say, no, if God said pray for miracles, I'm going to pray for miracles and I'm not going to stop until we start to see those miracles happen. And, and so that's the, the attitude that we take is no matter what, no matter how long it takes, I will persevere. Uh, and my final point here is that we should expect to see power. Okay, so the reward for Shammah's bravery and perseverance uh, was that he found himself in a fight that he could not possibly win. Uh, you know, we don't know how many Philistines there were exactly, uh, but we're just told uh, the Philistines gathered together or banded together. So it doesn't sound good uh, for Shammah by himself. Uh, he was at the point where he needed a miracle. Uh, maybe if more people were around him, he thought, you know, we could be brave and, and win this fight. But now it's like, uh, only God can do this. Uh, he needed a miracle, and that's exactly what he got. You know, it says, Shammah fought bravely, but it says, the Lord worked a great victory that day. And once again, this is the biblical pattern. Uh, you know, going back to Abraham one more time, uh, God's instruction to him was go and have kids, and, and his wife was barren. Okay, so there was no way that that victory was going to be won by him um, by just the strength of his own uh, fight or willpower or anything like that. He had to see God uh, come alongside of him and, and give him and give them miraculous power. Um, that's, the, that's the only way that we win our fights. Again, you think about Jesus commissioning the disciples and saying, go into all the world, uh, win the world for Christ. Um, but then in Acts 1 verse 8, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So again, it's not like God was giving them this impossible task and just sending them off. He was saying, no, you're going to experience my presence and you're going to experience the power of my Holy Spirit. I am with you. I can work miracles on your behalf. Uh, and I'm convinced that this is uh, that God wants to show his power to us. To us. He's been speaking about it. Uh, he's been promising it. Uh, and, I think, and I believe because of that, he wants us to pick fights that can only be won by his miraculous power. Yeah, so this changes our prayer life. Like I'm not praying so much now for my kids to have a good night's sleep uh, because that doesn't require a miracle of God. You know, I'm like, I want to pray for things. Like what would I pray for if I believed that I would see the power of God? What would I start praying for? And this is what God says is, yeah, go for those things. I am going to come in power and be with you and answer those prayers and win those fights. Uh, so, so this is my last point here is we just, uh, you know, we raise the level of our expectation. We wake ourselves up to remember God is with me. He's in the fight. He's going to work miracles. He's absolutely going to do it. Uh, so just in conclusion here, uh, you know, take your stand. Know uh, where your field is and know that it matters. Uh, and then don't back off at discouragement. Say, no, I'm going to keep in the fight. And then, you guys, I'm telling you, just expect to see power. Pray for God to empower you. I totally believe that he is going to meet us and we're going to see it uh, 
in our time, in our day. We're going to see the Lord work great victories as we say, yep, we are those who stand and fight.